Edmar John Mednes, born March 22, 1937, died February 13, 2002. He was a Latvian born American chess player, he was a chess writer. He received the Grand Master title in 1980. He wrote 26 books on chess, including Practical Rook Endings, Strategic Chess Mastering the Closed Game, hundreds of chess articles. Uh, he and Robert Byrne annotated many of the games for the Chess Informant. And he also wrote How to Beat Bobby Fischer in 1974, which was an annotated collection of all of Bobby's losses, including his own solitary victory over Bobby. They played nine times in all. This game was drawn. Bobby won seven of the others. But in 1962 at the United States Chess Championship, Edmar Mednes won their head-to-head -head game. We have E4 and a Sicilian defense, C5, Knight F3, D6, D4, pawn takes pawn. We have an open Sicilian. Knight takes the pawn. Knight F6. Knight c3. And g6 is the dragon variation, so named for the shape of the pawn structure here, apparently resembling a Chinese dragon. Bishop to e3. Bishop to g7. Pawn f3 is the Yugoslav attack. Black castles. Queen d2. Now bishop e6 leaves the opening book and gets a question mark from the annotator. The book move is knight c6, of course. And the main line is bishop c4, one of Bobby's favorite moves, or it would come to be one of Bobby's favorite moves. Bishop d7 showing the book line now. This is not what was played. Queenside castles. Rook c8 is the old line. And now bishop b3, knight to e5, pawn comes to h4, that is faced with pawn to h5, bishop to g5, rook to c5. White moves his king to b1. And pawn to b5. Now g4. And pawn to a5. Let's go back here. So in the game, Mednes with bishop e6, knight takes the bishop, pawn takes the knight, and you can see why bishop e6 was frowned upon. Now white has a structural advantage over black, black with three pawn islands, White with only two. Bishop c4 by Bobby. Queen c8. 
And it's because of this uh, structural compromise in the black position that white has a slight advantage. Ever so slight, I grant you. With this bishop under attack, it comes back to the safety of b3. Knight to c6. Knight to e2. King h8, and that gets an inaccuracy by the annotator. This same position would be reached again at the Ored uh, Macedonia European Club Cup, October 5th, 2009. So a lot of years, in other words, passing before this position was reached again. And that was in a game between the Serbian Grandmaster Slavisa Brenjo and the Russian-turned-Dutch Grandmaster Sergei Tevyakov. Knight e5 was the choice of the three-time Dutch champion Tevyakov. In this game, Mednes with King h8. Now, knight f4 to inhibit the pawn from coming to d5. But Mednes is not a believer, and he plays pawn to d5 anyway. Well, Bobby goes with knight takes the pawn on e6. And that is met with a big orange question mark, isn't it? That sacrifice is accepted. Queen takes the knight. And here's the point of the sacrifice. Pawn takes the pawn, forking the queen and the knight. Madness with knight takes the pawn, and now bishop takes the knight. Queen e5, and bishop takes the other knight. He'll not be given time to retreat his bishop to the e4 square. But Mednes is not interested in recapturing this bishop because he can gain tempo with queen takes b2, hitting the rook. Now Bobby here played rook to d1. I felt kingside castling would be the more principled way to defend his rook. You get your king safe and discover a defense of this. And after black captures the bishop, you can put this rook on d1, and you still have this battery. Coming back, Bobby played rook d1. Pawn takes the bishop. Bishop d4. That forces bishop takes the bishop. Queen takes the bishop with check. Queen takes the queen. Rook takes the queen, and we reach an endgame before white has even castled. Of course, if you're in the endgame, there's no point in castling. Usually, there are exceptions. Mednes played rook a to d8. Rook d1. Rook takes rook. Check. King takes rook. Rook f5. Now, theoretically, white should still have a splinter of an advantage here because black has three isolated pawns, but how to exploit that advantage really is the question. Bobby with rook e1 hitting one of those isolated pawns. Rook d5 check, king c1. Pawn to e5, moving the pawn to the safety of this rook's defense. 
Rook e4, King g7. Rook a4 coming after the next isolated pawn. And rook d7 defending. Rook a6 coming after the third isolated pawn. And rook c7 defending. King d2, king f6. All three isolated pawns are now secure. King e3, king e6, king e4, king d6. Now the king defends two of the three. Rook to a3, rook to b7, rook to b3. And rook to b3 is white's signal that he's willing to draw the game. And why not? You're playing someone 200 rating points higher than you. Certainly, you don't mind drawing that game. Now, Mednes could have dissolved, or I should say, connected two of his pawns with rook b5. But he goes ahead and just trades the rooks, because it should be drawn in either case, shouldn't it? And he allows Bobby to reconnect his pawns. c5, c4, king e6, pawn h4, pawn h6, pawn f4, pawn takes pawn, position dead equal, king takes pawn, king f6, king e4, last chance, but king e6, keeping the opposition. They repeated only once when they agreed to a draw. Bobby Fisher had an accuracy of 93.4. Edmar Mednes, an accuracy of 92.9. So both players very, very accurate. The single game rating feature here at chess.com rates White's play at a 2700 rating level and black at a 2650 so they both played well above their ratings the chess.com analysis coach says that game was pretty competitive white played a bit better than black in the opening the middle game battle was fairly even both players had incredible precision in the end game 